So hey, golfer's elbow. This is a really common condition in practice, but actually one where the anatomy is really important to understand. So if that's what you've come for, let's dive in. Hey guys, Khalid here. Welcome back to Clinical Physio. So golfer's elbow, let's dive into our 3D anatomy model. So this condition is all about an irritation to the tendons of the anterior forearm, which all insert into the common flexor origin of the medial epicondyle. What on earth does that all mean? Let's find out. So when we look at the humerus or the main arm bone between the shoulder and the elbow, if we run down to the distal humerus, we find that there are one, two key bony protuberances at that distal humerus. Now we have one on the lateral side or the outside called the lateral epicondyle and this actually forms the attachment point for all the key extensor muscles of the wrist which is tennis elbow. And we also have one protuberance on the inside or the medial side, which is referred to as the medial epicondyle. And that point is the key focus for this video. So let's take a look now at some of the key muscles that insert into that region. We have the flexor carpi ulnaris muscle. We have flexor digitorum superficialis. We have palmaris longus. We have the flexor carpi radialis muscle, as well as a bonus muscle, which is the pronator teres muscle, which is involved in this pronation movement of the forearm. And we can see with all of these how they run across the anterior or front surface of the forearm before inserting into the medial epicondyle of the elbow joint. Now, on this model, you can see how we've created the individual tendons here, but in reality, they all join together to create one single tendon, which is commonly referred to as the common flexor origin. And as you can see, that inserts into the medial epicondyle of the elbow. Hey, you've just found out why the medical term for golfer's elbow is called medial epicondylopathy. So that's the anatomy. How do we actually diagnose golfer's elbow? Well, the most common presentation is going to be those in the middle ages, between around 35 to 55. And it's going to be most present in individuals with an overload or lots of repeated gripping and or twisting. So here you might think about your individuals who have done a lot of DIY or a lot of gardening over the weekend, or you might think of those who do repeated gripping and twisting for a living, perhaps someone like a carpenter or a plumber, for example. And again, we would expect that it's going to be that repeated gripping and twisting, which is what aggravates their symptoms. Now, this is where the anatomy is super important. Where do these individuals get their pain? Well, as you saw, it's going to be around that medial epicondyle of the humerus, or perhaps just distally to this, which is where that common flexor origin, where all those tendons insert into that medial epicondyle. So that's where we're expecting the patients to report their pain. But then we can then palpate around this area to see if that indeed aggravates their symptoms. And when it comes to golfer's elbow, we would expect that to be the case. So what about special tests that we can use? Well, there is one in particular that I commonly go to. Now remember, the chief muscles that we talked about inserting into that medial epicondyle, we've got the wrist flexor muscles with that bonus muscle, pronator teres. So therefore, we're going to resist that movement to see if it irritates the patient's symptoms. So therefore, we bring the elbow to around 90 degrees, and then we ask the patient to fully pronate their forearm. We then get them to flex the wrist, and it's in this position that the examiner applies a resistance to see if the patient can perform the movement, and also to see if that movement involving the wrist flexors with that pronated teres irritates around their medial epicondyle. If it does, it could well be a positive for golfer's elbow. And then how do we treat it? Well, the first principle is about simple load management. This means reducing and controlling the amount of gripping and twisting that that individual is doing to see if we can calm down that common flexor tendon. 
From there, having deloaded, we then look to reload via strengthening exercises to see if we can progressively strengthen and increase the load tolerance of those common flexor tendons so that the patient can get back to the gripping and the twisting that they need to do in the future. Now, when I'm giving these exercises out to my patients, I want to make sure it's not too irritable for them. So I'm advising them to keep their pain levels to a maximum of 4 or 5 out of 10, and they need to make sure that their pain doesn't increase and linger around for a long period of time once they finish the exercises. So in the early stages, that may be done with isometric wrist flexion, where the bottom hand, as you can see here, is the one being worked, with a five second hold, eight repetitions for two sets. Or it might be eccentric wrist flexion, where the other hand controls the weight up and the affected hand controls it back down. Eight repetitions and two sets for this one too. And then it may progress to combined concentric and eccentric wrist flexion. Again, eight repetitions for two sets. And with each of these exercises, we're looking to gradually progress the weight as the patient symptoms improve. So guys, I really hope you've enjoyed this video. If you have, please support us by smashing that like button and subscribing to the channel for all our best updates. And don't forget, you can also check us out on Instagram at Clinical Physio and on our website, clinicalphysio.com. My name's Khalid. Thank you so much for watching. See you soon here on Clinical Physio.